Uh, we're going to just spend the next three weeks looking at this uh, mini-series, Resolving Conflict. Tonight's focus is going to be on forgiveness specifically. Uh, it's easy to say, hey, you should forgive, but it's harder to say, how? How do I forgive? Uh, how do you forgive when someone has done the unforgivable? How do you, hey, Rick, uh, how do you forgive when you know it just seems like I can never forgive this? And that's really what we want to look at. So uh, as, we, as we start looking into this, I just want to have a, a quick question. There, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just I want to hear from you. Uh, how can you tell someone doesn't like you or hasn't forgiven you, either or? Like in your experience, you know this person either hasn't forgiven you or they just don't like you. How, how, how can you tell? <laughs> Boy, when people don't like you, they really don't like you. Huh? <laughs> Todd's over here talking about people throwing rocks at him. <laughs> Boy, it's hard working for the city, I tell you what. Man. <laughs> And I thought I had a rough back in Thule. Man, I don't know anything. Uh, she said that sometimes people will just ignore you. Anything, anything else on that? You want to elaborate a little bit more or no? No, because people don't know me. I just plow ahead anyways. <laughs> That's awesome. Tell me what's wrong. Do you guys remember that song that came out a couple of, I guess it was maybe by Selena Gomez. And this, the words went something along the lines of, kill them with kindness. And she, the way she sang it just sounded very violent. She's like, kill them with kindness. Kill them, kill them. It's like, oh. <laughs> the song always gave me the creeps, whatever. Uh, okay, anybody else? How do you personally know, hey, this person doesn't really like me? <laughs> Shane? Okay, so they're, they're awkward around you, kind of short. I had a I had a height joke, but the guy that I used to tell that to, he's still in Tularosa, so he's not going to laugh at my joke. All oh, you guys are all normal size. Like, oh. <sighs> so we all, I think we can all say this, um, you can just kind of tell when people haven't forgiven you. You can tell when people don't like you, right? Well, in the same way, other people can also tell when we don't like them. They can, they're not, they're not stupid, they, they can tell when we... You know, haven't forgiven them. Uh, Sam Chand once said, a bad attitude is like bad breath. Everyone can smell it but you. And uh, I, I just couldn't relate to this more. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's one of those things where you think you're being so sly and smart and stuff, but it, it's, it's terrible. We, we know that we can tell. We're smart enough to tell when people are mad at us. But then on that flip, we think that we're so smart. And it's like, no, we're, we're not. We're not. Mark 11:25. And we're going to look at a series of different passages that I think all have something uh, unique to tell us about uh, forgiveness. And so we're going to look at all. The first, Mark 11:25. Can I get somebody to read that? So this is, uh, I'm sure you remember a couple of weeks ago. Uh, not that long ago. Well, maybe it was last month. We looked at this in, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. So Mark says something very similar. Luke words it a little bit differently, but it's all pretty much there. Uh, and something I wanted to point out about this is that this is not just a threat from God. Hey, if you don't forgive, I'm not going to forgive you. Yeah, I mean, yes, that, that is true. It's more like a, you know, that, that's like a promise from God, not so much a threat. But it, it's more so than that, it's also a consequence. It's a consequence. So if, if you don't forgive someone, what happens is that bitterness starts transferring. Maybe at first it's a squabble between you and your spouse. Then it turns to you and your spouse, and now you're having an issue with somebody at work or somebody at church. It starts spreading. It can start wherever. It Maybe the issue started at church. It, it doesn't matter. The, the point being that it spreads. And um, Hebrews talks about this, which we're going to look at in our study in Hebrews, where it says... Take care that, that the root of bitterness doesn't spring up among you and many people become defiled. It spreads. It's something that, that, that doesn't stay contained. Oh, I have this bad attitude, but it's okay because I'm keeping it to myself. I'm just going to swallow up all my anger. No, it, it's not going to work. It's going to come out. It's going to contaminate the whole group. Go ahead, Daniel. Did everybody hear the part where he said... That maybe his sister was right? Did everybody hear that part? That's the only part I heard. I mean, I'm just kidding with you, buddy. <laughs> He's like, oh, well, maybe a little bit. 
uh, so what happens, and this is something that I feel like sometimes we just kind of dismiss because something along the lines of this, well, hey, they started it. So it's okay what I'm doing because they started it. So which takes me to this, to this big point here. Okay, I want you to get this. If you do not forgive, that is a sin that you are continually doing. Every day that you are continually t- continuing to not forgive, you are continuing to sin. Every day. It's a continual sin you are doing. It, we, like to th- we know some things are sins, right? So we know, okay, if I look at pornography, that's bad. If I... Uh, do drugs, hey, that's bad. You know, if I, uh, if I steal, this is bad. All these things we know are bad. But then we l- allow things that are just inside of our own heart to be okay. Like, hey, it's okay if I sin because nobody knows about it. But, but they do, first off. And second off, it does spread. And, uh, and then third off, it is a sin that we are doing. And I will say that what I've seen repeatedly happen is, is that most Bitterness to God starts this way. You get hurt from whatever. doesn't matter what. You get hurt from something. Because you're hurt, you get bitter, which means you start getting mad at people. Now, that bitterness isn't, isn't dealt with because you've got good reason for your bitterness. It hurts. It can be maybe God let you down. Somebody died that you were praying for. Or maybe somebody else let you down. They did something that you didn't want them to do. Or whatever. Uh, the hurt goes you got a good reason for it, so now it, it turns to bitterness, it spreads. And then it, it spreads to the point that you start getting bitter at, at God. God, why did you even allow this to happen? You should have stopped this. You had the power, why didn't you? And uh, the thing is, we know that the world does this. We know that the world gets bitter. But what we fail to realize is that even us as Christians do this. We allow bitterness in our heart. We allow unforgiveness in our heart. It's something that we have to continually deal with. It's one of those things where, it's one of those conundrums, the conundrums that I hate. If you can admit the fact that you do this, you probably don't do it as much as when you can't admit to yourself that you do this. And so it kind of has to be where you have to, first off, you have to reflect on your attitudes. Am I doing this? Is this something that I'm doing? But then also, because you're not going to be able to pick up on everything that you do, you also have to be sensitive to God speaking. This is where that Holy Spirit speaking in your heart, you, you need that. You can't figure it out on your own. You're not, you're not smart enough. You don't, you don't have enough uh, uh, fail-safes in place to circumnavigate the need of the Holy Spirit. And uh, unforgiveness, remember, if, un, if not forgiving is a sin, then we can know that unforgiveness shows a heart issue in you. If you're having a problem forgiving somebody, that is showing you that you are having a heart problem. So the first step to forgiveness is simply, are you ready to forgive? Are you in a place where you are ready to forgive? If you're not, this shows that you should be seeking after God. And sometimes we try to forgive people without actually involving God in the process which is just a futile pursuit, and I'll mention this at the end. Colossians 3.13, let's look at that. Anybody want to read that? So, one thing that's important when you're trying to forgive somebody, don't continually, continually bear in mind how they have wronged you. You know what I mean? You're constantly thinking about what they did. You're replaying it, thinking about things you could have said differently, things you could have done differently, how it should have happened, all these different things. You're constantly bearing in mind how they wronged you. Instead of that, change the dialogue in your head, and instead of bearing in mind how they, how they wronged you, focus on how Christ forgave you. When you switch the narrative between, look at what they did to me, to now, look what he has done for me. It completely changes your perspective. Because somewhere along the lines, we know that we get saved by grace, but then somewhere along the line, we start thinking that I have to prove myself as a Christian. I have to do good enough to be a Christian. I have to earn my place in the kingdom. Somehow, somehow, I was saved by grace, and now I have to kind of prove myself. Christ forgave me a lot then, but now... There's not really much for him to forgive me for. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. 
And once we get to that place, we start thinking pretty highly of ourselves. And usually the problem is in conflict that we want to be treated better than Jesus was when he was on earth. That right there is the heart of most of the problems. If we were willing to be mistreated to the extent that Jesus was, I think we would have a lot less conflict uh, in our life. And whenever you go to the idea of, the idea of um, forgiveness, th- there's a foundational problem. And that's this. Somebody has a claim. You could say it like this. Who owes you when you're angry, right? You're, you're angry, you're hurt, you're, 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 you're suffering, uh, you're, you're, you're tr- trying to forgive this person, you just can't do it. The problem is the same. Who owes you? And that, that's the thing. You can't forgive them because they owe you. And so then that takes us to the same but yet related question. How can they pay? Okay, so here, I'll give you an example. This person's mad. They're mad at their dad because their dad wasn't there growing up. Okay. Do they have a basis for being mad? Yes. Ideally, their dad should have been there when they were growing up. Okay, so there's a basis. So it's excused because there's a good reason for the anger. So now then, the unforgiveness kind of starts to spread. And then we do, we start, ex- we, so I, he owes me. Okay, so what does he owe you? Well, he missed out on all those years. Oh, okay, be more specific. How is he going to pay for that? He can't. It's gone. It's done. He cannot go back in time. And anything that he does now, you're going to look at it with a judgmental eye. Why didn't you do this when I was a kid? It's like, well, I'm here now. It doesn't matter. It's too little too late. See what I mean? Already, it's at the point where I'm not going to forgive him. He had his chance. You see what I mean? And so we allow this unforgiveness in our heart because we have a good reason for it. And it just kind of spreads. And we're not able to really answer the question, well, who owes you and how can they pay? So you, in, this, in this situation, okay, so your dad owes you. How can he pay this off? There's an unrealistic expectation. It's something that cannot be done. And to combat this, what's helped me in the past is by realizing that I don't get what I deserve. And I mean that in a good way. So we all, if we're honest, we deserve a lot more, well, wrath and fire and judgment and punishment from God. But yet here we are. And, I mean, even on our worst days, we have a lot of good stuff going on for us. You know what I mean? God's uh, never really abandoned us as far as I know. Uh, I think I think it was, I believe it was David in the Psalms who said, you know, I, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And I mean, that's something that really doesn't change. We go through dry spells, we go through hard times, but God never forsakes us. And uh, so I would kind of encourage you to start praying, really praying when you are trying to forgive somebody. And I'm not just saying the cliche, God bless them. I'm saying more specific prayers. Um, So some specific examples. First off, release your claim on them. So they owe you. You are releasing it. God, I pray that what they've done, you would completely forget. That you would throw what they've done to me, that you would throw it as far as the east is from the west. That you wouldn't take into account the wrong I have suffered because of what they've done. That in your dealing with them... I would, whatever, whatever they've done wrong to me, you just forget about it. Release your claim. I no longer uh, am asking for God to curse them or, or whatever. I'm re- completely releasing my claim. Following up with that, instead of just praying generically a blessing for them, pray a blessing in the way that you would want if you were them. So pretend like you're them and then say, okay, I'm praying for them. If I was them, what would I want? And this is basically the golden rule, just applied to prayer instead. Treat them how you want to be treated. So pray for them how you want to be prayed for. It's basically the exact same thought. Um, Another way you can do this is uh, pray for their well-being and joy. It's very difficult when somebody's wronged you to pray. Pray that they're blessed, that they're happy, that they have a good life, that their kids, you know, grow up to do great things. You're like, no, I don't want that to happen. I want them to go through bad situations. I want them to get back what they deserve. And uh, when you start praying those things, it starts, first off, showing you the bitterness in your heart, which is good, because then you can actually repent. If you're blind to your own sin, you can't really repent. And then second off, it allows you to, um, 
to really move on from it. And so what we do is we have this kind of bitter mindset that we allow to kind of play in our heads, and it goes something like this. Well, they're going to get what's coming to them. Because you know what? They didn't accept Jesus, and when they get to heaven, they're going to be surprised because they're not going to heaven, they're going to hell. They're getting what's coming to them. See what I mean? And we have this attitude, and we justify ourselves because it's a righteous anger we tell ourselves. So it's okay for us to act immoral or for us to, you know, not really show the love of Christ because, hey, it doesn't matter because they had it coming. They threw the rock first. Now it's all fair game. And uh, when Romans 7, uh, 12, 17 through 20, we find this, uh, it's a paradox is what it is. And I'll kind of break it down in just a minute, okay? Uh, first, let's read it. Uh, can I get someone else to read this who has not read yet, preferably? Huh? Someone with a good reading voice like, Todd? <laughs> huh? What? Now, there's a lot of people who have a lot of crazy off-the-wall ideas about this verse. Some people think that there's some Egyptian uh, ritual or something where you put coals on your head to do something to... No, no, no. That's not a thing. Um, there's one manuscript that references to that. It's a very late manuscript. There's no evidence that this is in any way what Paul is, what Paul is, Paul is talking about. So just forget about that. The next thing is they're saying... Something about lighting a fire for them to bless them? No, no. It is talking about making them uncomfortable. It causes a pain to their conscience because you are not returning evil for evil. Okay, there's lots of different ways to repay somebody, okay? Somebody does good for you. You do good back. Okay, this is what we wish every, everything did, right? But then sometimes people do bad to you, and then you do good back. Sometimes people do good for you, and this is the one that God really, really, really warns us about when you repay evil for good done to you. That's one that God repeatedly says, hey, this is really bad. And you never want to take a blessing that somebody gives to you and turn it back into a curse. You never want to do that. Uh, but anyways, going back to this, is Paul is actually talking about the way that you make them uncomfortable, and it, it, it makes them where you are, where it's like a, a, a pain to their conscience. I, a good example of this would be when there's a married couple and the husband mistreats the wife, and the wife responds well with good character, and the husband just absolutely hates it. Absolutely hates it. He's like, oh, you know. I see, I've, actually, I've actually seen many situations where the husband eventually gets saved because of the wife's fantastic character. I have seen that numerous times, and, um, and this is part of that because it's a constant pain to their conscience that you're not responding the way that you're supposed to. I yell at you, you yell at me. That's how it's supposed to go. And, uh, but this shows a different way. And that brings up what I call the paradox, and now I, now, I can, now I can safely explain it to you. We want our enemies to suffer in, in our hearts. We're all born like this. It's okay. You don't have to admit it. We're all sinners. We all want our enemies to suffer. It's okay. But the only way to, get your, to see your enemies suffer is if you love them and don't want to see them suffer. And then you see them suffer and it pains you because you didn't want to see them suffer. It's a paradox. You finally get what you wanted and you no longer want it because your heart has been changed. That's the problem. And God even says it like this, look, if, if by chance, okay, I'm going to bring punishment on this person and you enjoy it, I'm going to remove the punishment from them. He's like, no, how's the only way to get around this? To no longer want punishment for the person. God, please withhold your punishment from this. Withhold your wrath. And we see oftentimes the prophets doing this. Please, God, please turn away from your wrath. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, God tells him flat out, he says, stop. Paying for that. I am not going to withhold, even if you and all these other righteous people stand before me, I'm still going to bring this about. They are getting exiled, and they are being punished for what they did. Jeremiah's like, okay. Uh, but, so this, that's, that's really what Romans is talking about here. It, it's, it's that Christian paradox. If you ever want to see somebody suffer, you're not going to see them suffer, and your heart needs to change, and God will actually turn the judgment onto you. But if you don't want to see them suffer... That's when they do suffer, and you're able, check it out, you're able to now intervene on their behalf. See what I mean? Because your heart's right. You can now 
pray for them. You can now care for them and serve them because your heart is right. It's really hard to care for, some, for somebody when you want to see them get what's kind of like, Haha, yes, their house burned down. They lost their car. They lost their job. It's fantastic. Oh, love and serve them? No. No, I'm finally getting what I want. See what I mean? And that's where it kind of reveals the bitterness in our heart. So Romans 12, uh, ooh, 12 14, uh, which I think I kind of pulled a, a foul ball on uh, Grace there. <laughs> she didn't know she had three, <laughs> three slides. Shane, can you read this? <laughs> That's what Grace thought she was signing up for. <laughs> okay, I had my fun. Something I want to get across is that is what persecution is. Now, the reason why I want to take the time to to, to tell you this is because of something that happened uh, in my in my uh, ministry. So, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with. Um, a lot of persecution, but but I have. Um, the last church that I was at, um, there was actually uh, some demonic things that were going on that I really don't want to talk too much about. Uh, but the idea was that there was some um, Wiccan communes and stuff that were actually um, casting spells against us, um, you know, different stuff like that. Uh, the leaders of the community um, were actually trying to stop what we were doing in the city. Um, we had uh, people um, come into the church and pretend to be Christians and then go out and badmouth us to the community and spread lies about stuff that we were doing, and it just kind of really escalated. It was a very lonely time to be in ministry. It was a very painful time to be in ministry. And uh, we had friends turn on, turn on us, family turn on us. The church experienced three different church splits. It was a very painful experience. And that is persecution. And the reason why I want to get this across is because I, I don't want you to see yourself as a victim. That's a complete waste of time. But I want you to know, so when you read the Bible, you don't instantly discount the encouragement that's there for you. There are some things that I read in the Bible that I never applied to my situation because I just figured I'm not in a Muslim country, so I'm not going through persecution. We have persecution here in the States. It's just a different kind of persecution. Um, some of the things that I could tell, and I don't want to tell them because there's no reason to. It would just be glorifying the bad that happened. I just want you to get, the, get this point across. You are going to ha- go through persecutions, not the kind of persecutions you're thinking of. You're not, probably not going to be beaten to death and all that stuff, but you are going to go through persecutions. People are going to call themselves Christians and not really be Christians. Uh, things are going to happen in the church and out of the church. You're going to be persecuted. Things are going to happen. And when, it ha- when this stuff happens, I want you to remember that Paul wrote a lot to discourage Christians who are going through persecution. You might not share the same kind of persecution, but the words will still apply to your situation anyways. Um, it, I, there, there were some things that... that um, I can, I'm going to vaguely mention, uh, one, one of the most painful things that we experienced was there were a, um, a series of people that we went out of our way to serve them, and we made it a priority through food pantries, through um, helping them uh, fix their houses, all kinds of different stuff like that. And um, then after we went out of our way to help them for month after month after month, have them turn on us. Um, that was a very painful thing that we experienced. Another thing, uh, there were a lot of uh, druggies that we were trying to get them help. So we were trying to start a men's center. And we naively had a, a community meeting for to answer questions because there were some you know things going around that weren't true. And uh, basically it just turned into the ending of Beauty and the Beast where uh, Gaston gets the villagers to come at them with pitchforks. It was a very discour- discouraging time. Uh, we had to just uh, kind of put the men's center off in the background. Um, which is why it was such a big deal for me when I left to have the house uh, purposed for the men's center. It was like a, you know, a, a final huzzah. We might still see this thing happen. Um, we, were, we were given uh, bad deals on stuff, and uh, people wouldn't work with us because we were, Christian, we were the Christian, Christians in the church doing stuff in the community. They 
continually opposed us at every single step we took. It was one of those things, it was a very hard thing to do. Um, Tularosa is a very spiritually dead place. Uh, it's a very painful place. Um, it's one of those, those things where they've been like that for generations, and it's not going to change anytime soon. So you have to be willing to just kind of sit there and wait, which is a hard thing to do. It's a, te it's a village of 3,000 people. It's, <laughs> your church isn't growing in this time. You're just kind of sitting and praying. And we had the, the work of the Holy Spirit. We experienced God in powerful ways, but that didn't make the pain any less real. Okay, so I just want to get this across. Persecution is mistreatment. You're going to experience it. Um, so not just physical harm from non-believers and restriction of rights and liberties, but mistreatment. Um, and one thing I learned throughout this time is I was starting to get really short-tempered, and I realized that past my anger is hurt. Oftentimes, if you're starting to have an anger issue, you have a hurt issue. You need to get your heart right. And I don't mean that the issue was necessarily your fault. Excuse me. But I do mean that when you are hurt, you have to take it to the throne of God. The only way is to be refreshed in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's it. That's it. There's no other way. There's no shortcut. And there's no quick solution either. This is something that takes week after week of praying, getting alone with the Word. And it, it's, it takes time. It's very painful. But you can do it. If you're willing to ask yourself a, a few key questions, first off, who are you really mad at? If you're having an issue with, with, with forgiveness and with anger, stop and really ask yourself, who are you really mad at? Because what we do is we say, this, I'm mad at them because they did this. It's like, well, not really. You were kind of already with a chip on your shoulder. You were at the end of your fuse anyways, and that just kind of set it off. There was something else. So then we go a little bit further and we say, well, I'm mad at this person. No, not really. Not really. You're disappointed because you thought God was going to do this and he didn't. That's what it comes down to. And so you just have to find out uh, what you're ignoring, what you're running away from, and usually that's where it is. And the second question, when did you start learning to not forgive? When in your life did you start learning to not forgive? When did you say, hey, it's okay for me to brush this under the rug and I don't have to deal with this? When did that start? You have to go back to that and you have to start forgiving. And if you just kind of keep ignoring it, it's going to keep being an issue. So I want to address one thing about forgiveness that I feel like is, is taught, but is unrealistic and doesn't really even make sense. And that's the statement, you have to forgive and forget. I'm sure you guys have all heard this. Uh, let me just kind of nip this in the butt. You cannot forgive and forget. It's impossible. And the reason for that is that you cannot induce amnesia. You went through it. It's going to be a memory. It's going to keep popping up in your head from time to time. It is impossible to forgive and forget. Impossible. It's going to stay in your memory. You experience it. Unless you start you know, going through dementia or those kinds of things, then you wouldn't have to deal with it. But otherwise, yes, this is something that you are going to have to live with. I mean, think about how silly. Apply it to something else. Hey, I lost my spouse. Oh, just forgive and forget. I mean, think about how silly that would be. You can't forget your spouse. You were married to them. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just silly. And also, I would add that you probably shouldn't try to forgive and forget. Let me give you an, a real-world example. You have your kid. They are molested. So you forgive the molester. Okay, I'm with you. And then you trust the molester again with your child? No. See, you can't forgive and forget in that situation, can you? You can forgive, but God never said to forget. He, he told us to forgive. And that's actually true forgiveness is when you can look at it, hand it over to God, and keep handing it over to God even as you struggle with it. Because a lot of your forgiveness, you will struggle with it for a long time. A long time. When you have something set in your heart, for instance, that God's going to answer this prayer in this way. God's going to heal my grandma. And then he doesn't. And you grow up into an adult who says, God doesn't heal people. So you're carrying around that same unforgiveness. You were hurt, you, you turned into bitterness, and now you just, God doesn't heal anymore. See, I mean, you've embraced something about God that's not true because you're allowing your, your experience to kind of rule the day. So the, the great thing about forgiving but not forgetting is that you don't have to make the same mistakes over and over again. Let's say, for instance, that, there, that the city, let's say Roswell City hates Christians. Let's just roll with me on this, okay? I'm not saying that they do. We're pretending, okay? 
And they say, no matter what, we're going to do everything possible as far as constitutionally we are able to shut down the church. So we're just going to really go all out and we're just going to try to trip them up everywhere that we can go. So we go and we open up our souls to them and say, hey, I'm so glad you're here. We're just really discouraged about the situation. So now they've got fuel for the fire. And they say, hey, they're discouraged about this. Let's attack them all their week. So then we forgive them. We say, hey, we're going to go bear our souls again to the city of Roswell. See what I mean? You shouldn't be doing this. You should learn from your mistakes. See what I mean? So yes, forgive. And once again, I'm not saying anything about the city of Roswell. They didn't do any of that. That was just an example. Uh, so you should forgive, but there's not a point where you should say, hey, I'm going to just keep on doing the same stupid things. I have known many people who they have a problem. Every time that they're with a certain person, that person twists everything that, says, that they say and starts a fight. So they keep going back into the same situation over and over again. Well, stop going by that person. I know, I know many people who say, every time we're with this person, we always gossip. We always do things we shouldn't do. We always go back into sin. We always start doing drugs again. We always start drinking again. Well, stop going around them. Forgive them. Yes, by all means, forgive them. But don't forget. Don't keep walking into the same error over and over and over again. There has to be a line when you say, no, I'm going to learn. Here's a, just a second. Here's a good example. When I was in pornography, I was in pornography for a long time. I got into pornography when I was nine years old. Nine years old, I was in pornography. I didn't get out of pornography until my early 20s. That's a sizable chunk of my life that I was in pornography. And do you know how I, how I got out of it? I stopped doing the same thing over and over again. I tried something new. For one, I stopped sitting at, the, at my house with internet access. See, I don't have to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Another thing I did is I used to say, okay, I have to get strong enough where I will no longer look at pornography. Yeah, okay. And in the meantime, I installed porn blockers on every single one of my electronic devices. It is impossible in my household for you to get on pornography. Try it. I dare you. You can't do it. Impossible. I have too many blocks on all my devices. It is impossible. You cannot do it. Cannot be done. I learned and I did something different. See how that works? God doesn't want us to keep on doing the same mistakes over and over again. He, he wants us to be able to learn a lesson and grow from it. Think about the story of Jacob. He's working for his father-in-law. It doesn't go well. And so he leaves. Does he go back to his father-in-law and say, hey, let's try that again? No, he stays in, over there. And then Laban stays over there. And it's better for everybody. Think about Abraham with Lot. You stay over there and I'll stay over here. And it worked out great. It really did. It was for everybody's best interest. So do not, do not heap this, this, this idea on yourself. I have to forgive and forget that's unrealistic. It is impossible. And you shouldn't do it anyways. Rather forgive, but forget. And that is going to require you to keep facing it for a while. That's okay. You'll get there. You just keep trusting God with it. And so forgiveness is not the same as trust. You guys get that? Forgiveness is not the same as trust. Okay. So as you are forgiving and you are trying to heal from this, ignore the opportunity to revisit the hurt. You are going to have opportunities to keep revisiting it. Somebody's going to say something, right? And you're going to be like, okay, I can, I can stick in my two cents. I can, I, can, I can say that little jab that I've been holding in for months now. Or they're going to do something else, and you're going to say, yep, just like them, they haven't changed. You're going to have opportunities to revisit the hurt. Don't do it. Ignore it. Keep going. Keep letting it go. Focus on the good things that they've done instead. If, it's really easy to demonize somebody if you focus on the good things that they're doing. Because this is what we do. Somebody hurts us or we don't like them, we only focus on the bad things that they do. You see people do this with pastors, right? A pastor first comes to a church, they're the greatest thing since, since butter. It's just, they're fantastic. But then after they've been there a couple of years, it's like, well, I don't like the way he does this and this and this. That's going to happen. Just like when you're married, right? You got married and, and they were the love of your life and then you've been married for a while. It's like, well, I kind of don't like the way they chew their food. It kind of annoys you. I don't really like that. I, 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 could, I could go without that for the rest of my life and it'd be okay. And it, it's, it's something very similar that happens. 
you start demonizing people and you fit the narrative of your mind that you want to fit, that they are all bad and you are all good. And that just helps us to hold on to the anger. Proverbs says it like this, and I'm going to read this one. Uh, Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers all offenses. If you hate somebody, you're going to stir up the conflict. You're going to keep poking the bear. If you love, you're going to cover all the offenses. You're just going to try and move on. So there's some ways you can do this. Stop talking about it. When we're angry about something, we feel like we always have to vent. We have to find that girlfriend who's going to tell us, I know, honey, he's just a jerk. We, we try to find these people, and we keep talking about it, repeating it, and we just work ourselves up. Stop talking about it. Sing it off. Stop repeating it in your head. Because we have what's called shower, uh, shower dialogues, where we replay it in our head, and we think of all the things we should have said, and all the ways we could have ended that, and we could have won that argument. And uh, you, you got to be able to move past that. You got to be able to stop talking about it. Repeat it in your head. Uh, and then uh, Morgan Freeman actually said something that was kind of funny. He said, people were asking him, Mor- Morgan Freeman, how, how do you, uh, how do you th- what do you think is the answer to, to racism today? And he said, uh, how did he say? I wish I could do, the, do his accent, but I can't. Uh, basically what he said is, uh, stop talking about it so much. I mean, you, you keep bringing it up over and over again. People are going to see something that's not there. And, you know, it's one of those things. Yes, that's absolutely true. Stop talking about the thing that, that you are having a hard time forgiving. Stop repeating in your head. Stop thinking about what you could have said. Weigh whether you are covering the offenses or making it worse. When you walk into the situation, are you making it better or worse? Are you able to talk to them and leave on good terms, or do you talk to them and get on bad terms? Weigh your heart. Weigh, weigh yourself on this. In a way, yes. If you're in a way, yes. So it's not just about you know saying the words, "Hey, I'm going to do better," but then actually taking some kind of action. Yes, um, but I'm more giving specific things. So like, okay, let's say let's say you're mad at your sister. Okay, stop telling other people about how you're mad at your sister. If you're mad at your sister, uh, stop thinking about how mad you are at your sister. Do you know what I mean? You're constantly repelling it in your head. Does that kind of make sense? Sort of. Okay. Uh, and um, so did I answer your question or no? Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, and then we are masters of, of, of gossiping and then telling people, I'm not gossiping. And we do this like this. When others are talking about it, we just kind of listen and insert a chuckle every once in a while. <laughs> I, I'm not talking. They were doing the talking. I'm just enjoying it. <laughs> We keep an eye out for bad things like, yep, I knew that he was going to do that. Okay, and this is the last thing I want to go through, go through before we close out, this last section here. And that's Peter, Peter versus Judas. This is a very important thing I want to point out, okay? Everybody thinks that they have a Judas in their life. Everybody. This is my, you know, my burden to bear, my pain in the butt, my, my betrayer, my Judas. And we, we always think, you know, we're the Jesus, obviously, and they're the, they're, the, they're the betrayer, the Judas. And the thing that I want you to get is that Peter and Judas both sat at the same table. Peter and Judas both betrayed Jesus. Three years of living with Jesus, and Peter is still trying to cut off this guy's ear. Three years of doing life with, with, with Jesus... And he's still, I, I don't know him. I've never seen this guy before in my life. I don't, I don't know. The, uh, I don't know. Three years. Judas never said he didn't know the guy. He said, hey, yeah, I know him, and I'll help you find him. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, you take that for whatever it is. I mean, um, they were both doing the same things. Um, but the difference being that Peter eventually came around to lead the church. And Judas eventually came around to kill himself. And here's the thing, Jesus sat with both of them. And John says that Jesus loved them to the end. There was not a time that Judas was with Jesus that Jesus did not love Judas. Okay, so I want, I want you to think about this the next time you think you have a Judas in your life, okay? Don't be too quick to decide who your Judas is. Because it might be a Peter in the making. Do you see the difference of perspective there? You, you can't look at the end of the story and say, this is a Judas. No, they are causing you temporary pain. 
That's it. You just got to give it time. You must forgive before the person changes. Because if you wait for somebody to say, I'm sorry, before you forgive them, you will never be able to forgive them. You have to reach a point of forgiveness before they say, I am sorry. You have to be able to so deal with it now. What happens when they die? And you, you, you can't go talk to them. You have to be able to get to the point of say, I forgive them before they even ask for it. You have to be able to say, well, what did I do wrong in this situation? I, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, your attitude stinks for one. But once again, you cannot restore somebody without repentance. If they do not turn from their sin, you cannot possibly forgive. Child molester, right? Still living as a child molester. Can he be restored? No. Child molester comes in contact with Jesus Christ. His life has changed. Can he be restored? Under, with, with certain precautionary steps, yes. With certain precautionary steps. See what I mean? The person has to reach a place of repentance before the work can be done. So repent and ask, and ask uh, God for help because here's the thing. Forgiveness is because the Holy Spirit does something inside of you. Okay, And that's the last thing I really want to end with on this. Forgiveness is ultimately a work of the Holy Spirit. So you have to get a place in your own life of being able to repent. I didn't forgive like I should have. Even if everything you did completely right, you allowed for unforgiveness to seep in. So you're repenting for that and you're asking God for help. God, I can't do this on my own. I really hate this person. I need you to help me change my heart. There's something ugly inside of me called sin, and I can't deal with it by myself. Sorry I went so long tonight, guys. And uh, if you are looking for an opportunity to serve, we have out there in the entryway there is a box. Uh, we are collect or not a box, it's a barrel. We are collecting canned fruit for Harvest Ministries. Um, that is a very easy and quick way that you can get involved in, in, in helping other people. And uh, so I just want to point that out. This Sunday is the last day to RSVP for the Making Sense of the Bible class. Um, we, we'll be closing that down so I can get all the packs together. If I wait any longer, uh, I won't have time to make all the packs before the class. So uh, this Sunday is the very last, last chance to sign up. Um, and the next week we will be looking at um, the five people in your life. I hope that this was beneficial to you. If you are having a hard time forgiving, I really hope that you can take something there. Uh, Lord, I thank you for everything you're doing in our lives uh, and through us and in the community. I just pray that the Holy Spirit would t touch each and every one of us, that we, would, uh, that we would see our hearts changed, that we would see others' hearts changed. We would really see the Holy Spirit just remake and set free and give a, a sense of life and renewal that we haven't seen in maybe years. God, I pray that you would uh, bring fresh springs, Lord, bursting forth from our hearts, that you would bring forth fresh growth, fresh works in the, in the community, fresh works in our spirit, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would do such a work in us that we are remade, continually remade, Lord, even if it's happened before in the past, Lord, we want to see it again. You do another fresh work in us. We love you, Lord, so much for what you're doing, for what you have done. Please continue to work in us and continue to give us a heart of uh, submission to you, God. We love you. Amen.